The information in this podcast is current on the day of recording. It is general advice only and does not take your personal situation into account. It may not be suitable for you. Participants in this podcast may also own the stocks discussed. For a full list of current recommendations and stocks owned by staff, members of Intelligent Investor can visit www.intelligentinvestor.com.au. Welcome to Stock Tech. My name is Gaurav Sodi. Joining me today is Mickey Mordek from Melbourne. G'day, Mickey. Hi, Gaurav. And uh, with us also is Research Director Nathan Bell. Hey, Nathan. Hi, Gaurav. Nathan, we better check in with Mickey to see if he's okay. You know, the, he's in Melbourne. The, the, it's supposed to be the best city in the world to live in, but not anymore. Mickey, how's it doing over there? Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for. Thanks for checking in. Uh, it's uh, it's it's pretty it's pretty it's pretty devastating. Um, <laughs> it's uh, yeah. I mean, you know, we all we all spent the three months in lockdown, hoping that the whole thing was you know being dealt with, and that the officials were you know um, doing their part, and and uh, and apparently apparently they weren't. Apparently, some of the security guards were just you know, not following protocols and that allowed the virus to escape. So, I mean, whoever's responsible for this, I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, hopefully they're held accountable, but it's, it's, uh, oh, he's, well, he's I think it was the premier anyway. He seems to be saying it was the people's fault when it was his. Well, it, how, how can it be the people though? I mean, we, we just followed the rules that we were given. I mean, you know, every every other state, uh, you know, has managed to handle this virus, and it's, you know, it's uh, it's. I mean, it's pretty. It's uh, it, people have sacrificed so much as well. You know, sacrificed their businesses, sacrificed their jobs. You know, uh, in some, in, you know, so it's pretty. It's pretty. I'm gonna put my pretty. I'm gonna put my crazy libertarian hat on and say this is what happens when you don't think for yourself and you follow governments who basically don't know better than you do. You know, I, I think if individuals, you know, took a bit of responsibility for their own behavior, um, I, I don't, they don't need governments to tell you that there's a virus and how to behave. Everyone knows what to do. Everyone knows to stay away, wear masks where possible, wash your hands. No, but the thing, the hard. thing was, the thing was that it was the, the, the people in quarantine, yeah. uh, were, went, you know, so the, the, the security, personnel weren't following the protocols and they yeah. were mingling with the guests and yeah. that allowed the virus to get out into the community. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, why, why we didn't use uh, police, police or why we didn't, yeah. um, you know, why they weren't following protocols um, is, is, you know, it's pretty devastating for a whole state to shut down again because of that is, uh, is pretty bad. Well, I think the thing that, uh, you know, Mickey and I following the banks and we've all talked about these loan holidays for small businesses and, um, you know, and for uh, people with home loans. And the D-Day was really September when a lot of the JobKeeper and other stimulus measures were supposed to be winding down. And now they're saying Melbourne's or Victoria's shut down for six weeks, which takes you into that, you know, late August. And like, I just don't know what it means for all these people with small businesses who have put put their homes up as collateral against those businesses. I just not seeing much talk about it. Um, but I'm I'm not feeling. Well, I think I think the banks have already agreed to extend um, all the you know the, the the payment delays that they had put in place already. I, I I think I read somewhere that that's going to happen, and it looks as though I mean, surely all those um, if you're going to lock down then the government, there's an onus on the government then to then compensate um, for for some of the losses. So all these job keeper, job seeker, um, all these things are going to have to be extended shortly. Like you can't end them in September. But I mean, this is this is the thing as well, is that, you know, so the cases are higher now than they were when we shut down the first time. And we yeah. were shut down, I think, for two months, was it, roughly? I mean, you know, at least a month. I mean, it was probably two. I, I don't know. It felt, it felt much so. longer, didn't it? <laughs> but, I mean, the cases are and, – and then even after you lock down, you know, the cases double because, you know, um, you know, there's a lag. So how long are we going to be shut down for? You know, is this going to be another three or four months? I mean, mm. obviously, as a Victorian, it's very, uh, you know, very – 
pertinent to me. But, it, you know, I just think maybe maybe it's too late. You know, maybe the cat's out of the bag. I mean, are we really going to shut down for another, you know, four months? I mean, it seems uh, maybe I'm just I've gone from one extreme to the other and I'm just a bit despondent, but it's, uh, yeah. yeah it's you're, all... you're living through it. Well, I think we, <laughs> we can be um, observers from the outside a bit more for now, although there's no doubt in my mind of <laughs> if it was in Victoria, then it's here. Considering we only closed borders what um, at midnight, so I have no doubt that the virus is rampant in New South Wales. Next two yeah. weeks are going to be interesting um, in here as well. Nathan, I'm curious why the the market hasn't really reacted that much. It was a little bit of a sell off yesterday, but I'm looking at my stock screen now, and not much has changed. I'm very surprised that there's not been a stronger reaction, considering the trajectory of the virus appears to have changed. I think there's, uh, and again, I'm just guessing here, but there's a couple of things. I think still the lead for markets is coming from the US. Uh, I don't think that's really changed. And the markets over there just keep going up. The, but the market's very different to the economy. And I think about 25% of the S&P 500 is just the tech stocks. And people are making an assumption that the tech stocks are going to be even worth more in the new environment than they were at the record highs in February, uh, I think that's a there's a question mark about that. Uh, particularly, well, there are three about... stocks now that are worth one point five trillion dollars or more on on the new on the US mm-hmm. market, and I wonder what the aggregate looks like when you take those three stocks away. I My think Google's is got it looks very different. I think Google's got one hundred and twenty billion US dollars just sitting on its balance sheet in cash. <laughs> yeah. They could probably just about buy the ASX, maybe X a few banks and BHP. <laughs> uh, it's just incredible the amount of money they're making. But if you're not in that, uh, like, I guess Zero is one that uh, sold from the ethical fund recently. And just the amount of assumptions you've got to make to justify a share price close to you just need everything to go right for another decade. And I just don't know how much juice we can squeeze out of those sorts of stocks. You know, as great a business as they are, just starting to get a little bit like, you know, I'd say it rhymes with 99. I think it's very different. You know, these are like a lot of, a lot of them anyway, like high cash flow businesses. But I think there's just a very easy story to buy these types of businesses at the moment. And you know, even uh, ResMed's another one. I, we sold the final amounts yesterday or the day before. Uh, it's trading at 40-something times earnings now. And mm. I think Fish and Pike or Healthcare might be at 60-something times earnings. Yeah. Is this like how, <laughs> like how much can you expect from these businesses? Like I know interest rates are low, but like I think that uh, the premium for low interest rates might be 20% or 30% at best, but is it double? Uh, like I, I'm starting to feel like, like 99, I think where Microsoft mm. got to something like 62 times earnings mm. and it took 17 years for the share price uh, to reach that high again and took a huge investment in the Azure cloud um, storage business for that to happen. Uh, I think some of those lessons are starting to be forgotten. Yeah, it- I mean, I've been pretty optimistic um, most of the way through this, but I'm starting to get a bit concerned about um, the market's trajectory. I've got this theory that um, I was telling Nathan earlier, Mickey, that um, that I reckon there's a correlation between hoarding toilet paper and the direction <laughs> of the market. <laughs> because when, when you think about it, what happened in, in March, um, you know, the virus was was out well before then and the market kept climbing, didn't care. It was only when consumer behavior started to change we had hoarding and and people staying away um you know sh- voluntarily shutting down that's when the market panicked um that's when the government started acting and, and locked down as well and you had this huge spike downwards and then consumer behavior rebounded first you saw people stop hoarding uh, more people venturing out roads filling up with traffic and the market rebounded quickly well, yeah. the tra- trajectory, trajectory now is completely changed. It's it, people are now hoarding again. Uh, I think um, I, haven't, I haven't checked traffic volumes yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if they're starting to level off a, a little bit in, in Victoria, at least, if not anywhere else. Um, and uh, there's new restrictions in place, so you know, but by the toilet paper uh, profits, um, the uh, the market m- might be in for a, a rough ride. If well, it's it's a, it's it's it, I think it's not it's not crazy. I mean, it is a sign of panic as well. I mean, if people are going out buying hoarding supplies, you know, they're probably panicking. And 
and and and so markets are driven by emotion so you know if, if people are panicking buying toilet paper maybe people will panic and sell their stocks or maybe well, that's people right. well, will panic buying, and buy stocks you know but but it's not just stocks but panicking and uh, hoarding um comes with a host of other behaviors as well it means you're probably not be spending time outside you're probably not buying purchasing things in stores um, it, it, it's an indicator of lots of other different behaviors that have a real impact on businesses in the economy. It's not, you know, it, it's not just about buying and selling stocks, um, in my view. Yeah. Yeah. But what, what happens from here, gents? Um, you know, I, I was originally, I wanted to talk about some of the lessons um, uh, from the pandemic and if it changes your investment style or the way you think about investing, but it's probably too early now to start thinking about lessons. But Mickey has... Has the way you think about stocks changed because of this at all? Or do you think it should change? Is this just a blip we should forget about? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really torn because I feel like on the one hand, like Nathan was saying, you know, the valuations are pretty extreme in any decent company. And, um, and maybe that's just something we have to get used to when there's low interest rates. But you know, are interest rates going to stay low? I mean, you know, so it so much hinges on that question because if if interest rates rise, well, then, you know, you've got an economy that the economy's over if, if interest rates <laughs> rise. So, uh, you know, so I guess interest rates have to stay low. And, and then so if they have to stay low, well, then, maybe you can justify these crazy multiples. Maybe what was cheap in the past isn't cheap now. So it's just it's just a really tough time to invest and I, I think you just wanna be in you just you just wanna be in right on the on the company and and know that in twenty years it can be a bigger business and a better business. And and I think valuation is just uh is I don't know. I don't know how you value a business in this environment, really. So I think that's the challenging part. The market is over. We're going to get T-shirts made up uh, with Mickey's face saying those words. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Nathan, if interest rates rise, the economy is over. The economy is over. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> on, on the front, we'll say if interest rates rise. On the back, the economy is over. <laughs> Go home, everybody. Na <laughs> we'll make a fortune. Um, Nathan, what about you? Do you think about stocks differently now after going through this experience? And do you think it should matter? Should it change your style? I don't think about them any differently, but I do think that this is a extremely unusual situation because normally when you've got panic about the economy and thinking about a potentially a big or a long recession, huge debt levels, normally the stock market's uh, in peril as well. And so valuations are cheap. Yep. And you're getting yep. compensated for taking the risk. So it's really about just hanging in there. I don't actually think there are any lessons to learn when the market uh, goes down. Like you just got to buy the best businesses you can and then just be patient. I just don't think there's any um, you know, interesting science to it or anything. It's really just about holding your nerve and buying the best thing that you can and making sure that you can get through if, it, if the recession lasts a bit longer than you expect. But what I found really difficult is I think the market looked expensive on – uh, on historical measures, probably five or six years ago, and yep. we're still, even, you know, in the US, we're within I think ten or maybe even five percent of record high valuations ever in history. That's what makes this tough, uh, because everyone I think feels very safe buying the healthcare companies, buying the tech stocks because there's the revenue growth, and essentially people are hiding out in them, and that's and they've been an, like an amazing, amazing place to be invested over the last ten years, and. Unfortunately, we haven't, didn't make the most uh, out of the stock recommendations for members in our portfolios with things like Nanosonics and CSL, Fish and Paykel Healthcare, which were all buyers at one point. But you know, I remember when Fish and Paykel Healthcare fell, I think it was 2011, and that when the markets fell then, uh, but, uh, I think it was based on the problems in Europe, and the stock for Fish and Paykel Healthcare got down to $2.20, and it was still 20 times something earnings. But the earnings were a little bit depressed for a couple of different reasons and thought this was a good buy. And then I think we put a sell on it at like $3 or $3.50 or something, thinking mm -hmm. 25 times earnings was high. 
you know, never in my wildest dreams did I think it would be going to 60 times earnings or <laughs> go up. I mean, what is it, $28 now or $30 or something? like? 60 is the new 20. <laughs> There's just, it's just no way in the world not, you would have ever thought that would have happened. Not to mention, um, Fisher & Paykel was the number three to two very large dominant firms. It, it, it seemed crazy at the time to suggest that it would be worth 60 times earnings. I remember being part of those discussions. <laughs> and you can see on the comments section on that uh, buy article where I can't remember who it was, but member said, you know, I'll, I'll just stick with ResMed. It's uh, you know the big dominant player, and yeah, um, you know, it just looks silly in hindsight. But um, you know, like even Nanosonics, like there's no way I thought. I think it was seventy eight and a half cents when we first recommended it. I'd never was thinking it was going to seven dollars, and if it did, there's no way I thought it would have a two billion dollar uh, market valuation and like an absolute tiny amount of profit. Uh, as good as a business as it might be and as good as business model, I just feel like there's so much hot air in that stock. And if they don't come out with an absolute blinder of a new product, um, then that share price could fall quite quite a lot. I guess I've been thinking a little bit about um, tail risks. And, you know, we've always, in our investment process, uh, I think we all think about tail risk, but it's more of a, okay, I thought about that. And, and you tick the box to say you thought about it. But <laughs> now I'm starting to actually ponder well what does that mean does that mean you know if a business um is fatally exposed to a low probability event i'm not really sure what to do with that anymore you know does that mean you don't buy it do you buy less of it do you demand a higher margin of safety or do you just prepare yourself mentally for the idea that um this is just a much more volatile game than we thought it was i haven't really got answers for that but those are the sort of things i've been thinking about um you know these these low probability events do happen, and when they happen, they have they have really serious consequences. I just don't know what to do with that knowledge now that it, we've we've learnt it kind of the hard way. If you look at the just, businesses that have sorry, if you look at the businesses that have really suffered recently, uh, companies like in travel, for example, they typically the businesses with high fixed costs. So when those revenues have collapsed, it has a much bigger impact on the bottom line. You know what I love? I, I love when, when we're positive about a business, it's called operating yeah. leverage. When we're negative, <laughs> oh, they've got high fixed costs. <laughs> I mean, to, to make your point, like Flight Center has been one of the most conservatively run yes. businesses yes. Uh, that I can think of. Balance sheet's always had net cash. Yep. It's, you know, it's taken, you know, what is it, like 40 years or whatever to build that business step by step, year after year. They've been criticised for 10 or 15 years for not getting onto the internet sooner, for not adapting, and yet this is a business that's had two books at least written about its culture. And and like the founder, uh, so Screw Turner was one of the founders, and I think about 18 months ago, maybe two years ago, his shareholding in the business made him worth $850 million. Mm. And at today's price, uh, I think maybe he's worth $120 or $140 million dollars and almost lost the business and yet he'd done everything he could have possibly done right yeah uh, and so i think that the nature of those business models um is something that i'm i'm thinking a lot about thank you yeah well i mean i think i think that's right i mean it's it's a it's it's a it's a crazy time to be investing when you know companies aren't allowed to make revenue uh and the government has to support them. So uh, I guess we're just lucky we live in an economy where, you know, the government actually can support this many businesses. But <clears throat> I think, uh, yeah, so I guess it just, it, just, it just impacts how you think about risk. And I, I reckon that's right, Gaurav. I mean, if you think about these tail risks, they do happen. And yeah, and you have to invest on that basis. So, yeah, uh, you have to you have to think about businesses that are capital light, that are digital, that are founder led, and you know don't have much debt. And but I, but I also think it's a mistake to think about tower risk and think and then and then swear off an investment because there's a you know five percent probability that um, something awful happens. Uh, if you do that, you just don't buy anything. And I think sometimes the greatest sin of investing is not buying stuff you know this is this is we we're, we're, we've been talking and writing about this a little bit internally but this is a game for optimists and if you can't be optimistic in your investments i just think you should stick to bonds or something you know it's, it doesn't yeah. work if you're if you're not going to be optimistic 
I reckon that's that's right, but it's um, the other uh, thing I've been thinking about. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, sorry. I reckon I reckon that's right, but uh, it's 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 just one of those things where, like, if you if you're thinking really long term about a business, and you're thinking I want to hold this business for the next ten or fifteen years, then you have to like those little probabilities over ten fifteen years. They actually make up a, like they actually become big probabilities. Um, Oh, and that's so, a good point. yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So, because because the more times you roll the dice, the more yeah. likely it is to happen. More so the, mm. yeah. Uh, so you know, so if you're thinking I'm going to hold this business for 10, 15 years, which you have to think in these current valuations, well, then you don't really want to hold businesses with these big, you know, exposures to these risks. I guess. It's amazing that's when you the, go through a downturn, and you start. I at least myself start thinking a lot about the buffetisms. That I haven't thought of for a very long time, mm. and one of the things that he was always warning people about was, you know, there's a whole bunch of different quotes you could use for the same thing, but the amount of debt that companies use, you know, if you're always reliant on having to go to capital markets to get by, it's a huge risk, and that was exposed during the GFC, and obviously we talked about flight center just before, and that didn't, wasn't relying on the kindness of strangers, given it uh, supposedly had plenty of cash on the balance sheet. So um, that's something that's different this time around. But if you look at those great businesses and the healthcare companies or the technology stocks, the ones that just have that internal cash flow to reinvest and not have to go to the markets, I mean, it just makes you feel so much better about the businesses. And when you go through these downturns, it just means they can invest in marketing, try and pick up that market share. So in some ways, I think even though it's a new new risk, um, this the pandemic. Uh, sometimes it just brings out old lessons. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, the the other point I actually wanted to raise before we move on, gents, and we probably should uh, move on soon, is that um, I read this article. I think it was from a academic um, finance dude, and um, he was saying that um, you know when if you remove the entire earnings of a business for one or two years. So if a, if a business owns zero revenue for one year, or, or I think maybe it was two years he was talking about, that on a classic DCF, discounted cash flow um, valuation, it only wipes up about 10% of the valuation. And it just made me think, it reminded me, I guess we know this, but it reminded me that how much of a company's valuation is really tied up in, the, in a you know, sort of a very long period of time. What happens in one or two years is really a very small portion of a company's valuation. And it just reminded me also to think very long-term when I'm valuing stocks. And, and when you do that, it's easier to buy into distress um, and into cyclicality when you think about the, the so much of the company's value is actually, you know, it, it's decades of, um, it's decades out. Things like um, the airports, um, maybe some of these travel stocks, um, center group, these are sort of businesses I'm, I'm thinking about now when I'm, looking at, um, you know, restrictions and thinking, well, the company's not going to earn revenue for a little while. But on the other side of that is that the company's valuation is actually captured mostly by what happens over decades. Um, we forget that sometimes, I think. Let's move on to Macquarie Telecom, gents, because this is a business that, um, well, I'm thrilled to talk about it because it's actually something that's doubled within the space of, what, three months. And in fact, I think in the last four weeks, it's doubled it's actually hasn't moved that much for a while and then all of a sudden it's taken off very quickly um we've covered off the reasons for that in the in an article um that was published so i didn't really want to talk about the company that much i'm really interested in in what happens from now nath we had a bit of a discussion about this internally as well he's a company that that we've agreed i think there's a consensus that it's a high quality business there's no doubt it's superbly managed there's no doubt it's got a lot of um, tailwinds behind it. Uh, and yet, what happens when all those good things co-mingle with a share price that looks a little bit hot? What do you do? So if, the lesson, if there's been any lesson over the last uh, cycle since the GFC that uh, we've learned, when uh, I talked about some of the cells we put on Fission Pock or Healthcare way too early, Aristocrat, which we followed all the way down to two dollars, and we sold it. So, you to ask yourself whether you just need to keep learning the old lessons over and over. And here I am, sold Macquarie Telecom. 
it's another it's like ticks all the boxes got a good business it's growing it's got the insider owner which is something i'm pretty mad about you know balance sheet's fine uh, it ticks all the boxes and 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 finally i think the market's caught up on the value that we've um, identified over the last year or two and here i am selling it like you know is this just another situation where this over the next you know however many years it's going to keep going up and i'll just say look you've just committed the same mistake again but i think one of the biases that i've got in my mind at the moment and this could be completely wrong and potentially cost us some returns is that the market is very expensive and the market should be volatile over the next year or two like this covid thing is not going away anytime soon and we haven't really had the hit to the economy yet so in my head we're going to have lots of opportunities over the next 12 or 18 months uh, especially as start to wear off and we start to see some of the real pain starting to maybe see you know more bad debts in the banks or whatever it is and maybe expectations mm-hmm. for quick recoveries for a lot of stocks is going to take you know at best longer than so to me that should mean that there's going to be lots of opportunities over the next year mm-hmm. this is that when we get a really good price for a stock and with like zero is another one sold recently and now macquarie telecom uh, and these are the sort of stocks everybody's chasing at the moment my view is i want to sell them and say thank you very much mr market for the good price because over the next 12 or 18 months i know that, that cash is going to be really valuable and we're going to have lots of opportunities to invest in but i could be completely wrong and maybe those opportunities don't come and i'm actually in the process of writing an article that uh, talks about this is maybe we're stuck with these expensive markets and maybe the recovery does come uh, reasonably quickly over the next year maybe about and everyone you know the market uh, prices that in or but in but you just don't get that big next shoe to drop in which case you know maybe it's a mistake selling some of these businesses it's tricky because uh, ignore valuations i think that's the thing i'm, I'm really getting to mm. yeah no i well i hold it personally and i haven't sold it in my own portfolio and the, even though i acknowledge i think it is a bit toppy and it's a little bit tricky to justify today's price with today's numbers, but um, some of the stuff you've highlighted, Nate, like it's got great management. There's still lots of optionality to grow in the future. So I think it can grow into its valuation. And sometimes I do think it's really hard just to find these great ideas. And when you've got one, especially with a low liquidity stock like this, where it's hard to get in and out, um, for, me, for me, it, it may, does make some sense just to hang on and, uh, and to ride out bouts of overvaluation. But that comes at a cost because it means I have to sit there holding an old overvalued, potentially overvalued stock in my portfolio while there's other cheaper stocks that could potentially generate better returns. So you might not, it might not be optimal, but it might make sense depending on what you're trying to accomplish or your liquidity um, requirements in, in a particular stock. But I think it's an example of how investing needs to be sometimes a, a personal decision. Um, Hoff, our, our, you know, Greg Hoffman's always um, banging on about this as well, that, that a lot of your investment choices are actually personal and they, they need to be personal. And we tend to talk about it in very general terms. Um, and this, I think, is an example of, of that, where a bit of um, your personal situation probably matters here and that will dictate what you do. Well, Be- and, and you've highlighted the difference as well between, you know, holding it in your personal account and also us holding it in a managed fund. Uh, you know, in the managed fund, we're, we're trying to beat the benchmark and we're trying to deliver good returns. Whereas in your personal account, I guess you don't, you don't have that pressure. So you can, yeah. you can hold on and you can just, just ride it out. Um, and if you have a period of low returns, it doesn't matter, I guess. So, uh, I think that's right, Mickey. And one of the, uh, like, you've always got to think about like stocks don't just exist on their own. They do exist within a portfolio. And if I look at the portfolios at the moment, there's not um, too much cash in them. Uh, it's just gone up because we've sold a few stocks in the last few days, but uh, it ranges between, I think, about 13 or 14 uh, in the income and growth fund to um, something more like uh, 22 uh, at the moment for the ethical fund. And like for me, uh, particularly with the growth and ethical fund, if the markets continue to do well, then I think we can still outperform the market, even though we're holding that amount of cash. 
And the reason is because we've got a lot of small cats, which I think as a team we really, really like. Um, you know, I, I really like Frontier. I think that could easily double. Um, you know, we've got RPM Global, and there's a whole bunch of other ones that could do really well over time. So I think even with that 15 or 20% cash, if the markets do well, we'll still, we can still outperform. But if you've got a portfolio of Woolworths and Coles and, yeah. uh, you know, the banks and yeah. those type of things, then I just think that's going to be a really tough place to get a decent return from these valuations. And if you've got lots of cash, the question is, you know, do you really want to be selling those great businesses when you've got them? You might be more willing to hang on to them. And the other thing is the situation has a big impact. Um, I, I know personal friends who over the last four or five years have made a lot of money in the GFC recovery and, and don't work, um, so they don't earn an income anymore. They're just managing their own portfolios. And they just talk about their huge amount of tax you have to pay on the, you know, if you've got a 10-bagger um, and you've got like a serious amount of money in it, the amount of tax you have to pay on that if you sell it and move uh, is extraordinary, you know, far more than you ever have to pay for uh, from an income uh, just because the amount's bigger. So you know, that, that personal situation is so important and that's where I think your bias has come from. I'm really looking forward to the day where I get to sit down and complain about how much tax I have to pay on my 10-bagger, though. It's a nice topic for that. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> just on Macquarie specifically, quickly, I just wanted to highlight that one of the reasons it has jumped so much is that the management has has announced that they are going to break out for the first time um, the results uh, for the cloud and database business. They've traditionally run in two camps called um, known as government and um, traditional telecoms. And it's been really hard to sort of gauge how much that cloud business is actually growing. And we've had to uh, kind of assume um, and uh, take a bit of a guess at what's been happening. And that's why we've had a different idea about the business compared to the market. But I think now that they're going to separate those numbers out, it's become going to come very clear that it's got a substantial cloud, cloud business that's growing very swiftly. And uh, I think a lot of investors are buying that in anticipation of people being able to see those numbers. And it's an example of uh, of how nothing actually changes that much in the business except the way results are presented or, or the way the company is perceived. Um, yeah, so it, it's, it's, it's a tricky one. It, it does look pricey when we consider that very little has changed since we bought this stock at half the price um, a few months ago. You might comment on this, Gaurav, but I think one thing that uh, is, is also happening here is that Macquarie Telecom has been really underfollowed, from what I can tell, by sell-side research for a long time. Yep. And the reason is because it's very liquid yes. and it doesn't need coverage from sell-side to go and make big acquisitions. It's um, just yep. generally sorted things out itself. So there's been real no incentive for um, the big research houses to follow the stock. But when the stock goes from $20 to $50, mm. all of a sudden a lot more shares start getting traded and the volume and it actually comes on to more radar screens for investors. So, you know, a lot of momentum investors, maybe some um, ETFs. I mean, it is, there's a big insider holding here, so that sort of keeps it quite liquid in terms of um, the free float of shares that can be bought and sold. Uh, but just technical aspects of um, trading liquidity I think are also having an impact. Absolutely. There's no question about that. And you're right, it's been underfollowed. And it's, it, the business only has, I think it's uh, like 70 million shares are, uh, have been issued. It never raises capital. Uh, and it's always been very careful with debt. Uh, it's a sort of conservatism you only ever really see from, from founders. And it's one of the main reasons why brokers haven't covered it in the past. But you're right, when it's amazing the enthusiasm. Nothing, nothing can get you the tag of high quality business than when your stock price doubles quickly. Then everyone thinks you're a high quality business because the <laughs> price has doubled. Um, but, you know, I think we've got to be careful about following the trajectory of prices and letting prices um, label what we think about businesses. We've got to try and keep prices to one side and, and look at businesses in terms of value. Uh, it's hard to do when prices are moving around a lot, but that's one of the challenges, um, especially in this sector. And we've had some suggestion that, oh, we're being too conservative with Macquarie, that uh, market price is 50 and we're, we're being too conservative. Well, maybe that's the case. But, you know, um, 15 days ago, the market price was 20 something. So, <laughs> you know, let's try and keep some perspective here. Uh, you know, we, we, I think that maintaining that independence between price and value is paramount. Otherwise, you just end up being the crowd 
and that's exactly what we're trying to avoid. Illiquidity, illiquidity can be sword, and you you often read about great investors um, just absolutely screaming um, how they just stay away from your liquid stocks yes. uh, because they've been through a downturn and they just haven't been able to get out of those positions. Yeah. But I think, but it can be a real advantage too if you can discover these really high quality businesses that are just under the radar. And if you're a small fund like like we are, uh, we can certainly own some of them and. Uh, the one thing I'm always looking for in those companies is founder led because they like statistically the research just shows they just do much better over time and in a world where there's lots of data, better systems, the markets are more competitive than ever. Amazingly, this insider ownership is still a statistically reliable way to beat the market. So when I think of things of like Frontier, 360 Telecom, uh, which are all quite illiquid, they're stocks I really want to own for a long time and I'm happy to certain amount of the fund in them, but a limit as to how many of those positions you want to be in because uh, 360 Capital, uh, I feel like some bloke just woke up <laughs> when it was probably on the day the market like hit its bottom in yeah. uh, February, in March and just absolutely wanted his money out. He was probably sitting in bed still, um, you know, with his eggs and bacon there. Just said, no, I've got to get out. And he sold $40,000, uh, may have been a lady, but sold $40,000 worth of stock. And the share price fell, I think it was 18% uh, from that one trade. And that brought the share price down to 61 cents. Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the business at all. And the look through cash alone in that business uh, is going to be worth 72 cents. Um, forgetting about any other investments in the business and the funds management business that you're essentially paying nothing for over time. So we had to report these results where, uh, to me, 360 Capital was this essentially cash box, but because it was illiquid, this one little trade had this huge impact at the bottom of the market, and we had to put report numbers that looked our, made our performance actually look much worse than what the underlying performance of our businesses were. Uh, so, so that liquidity is really the big advantage, I think, of being in stocks, which is why you see stocks fall so fast in a recession, because people have problems with home loans or credit cards or whatever, and the easiest thing they can get their uh, hands on, uh, aside from their deposits, is to sell stocks and they've got the cash in two days. And I think that's a really important lesson in portfolio management. I'm really looking forward to the day when Nathan meets this mythical guy in the, with the bacon <laughs> next in the pajamas. You are going to yell at him so much. <laughs> that's going to be a good conversation to be to be part of. Uh, let, look, let's move on um, and discuss uh, another sector, actually, that, that we've done actually reasonably well in, in getting access to, but things have moved on. And I want to get an update from both of you. Um, let's talk about these casino stocks. Um, so specifically, we're talking about Star Entertainment and um, Crown. It's Crown Resorts, I think it's called, isn't it, Nate? Crown Resorts, yes. So these are companies we picked up um, during the downturn. We added it to the, the buy list, and I think there was some portfolio allocation as well. The share prices have moved up a little bit. But the requirements for social distancing and some of the margin pressure still remain. Neith, what's your view on on these companies? If you look at them in terms of normalized earnings, they actually look quite attractive. How much of a discount should we bake in for margin pressure because of COVID regulations? There's a few aspects. The casinos are a very good example of the high fixed cost business model. So once you... So we like you, these stocks. We're going to pull up them. <laughs> so once you get, um, you know, that incremental value of, you know, I don't know what the number is, the five thousandth visitor, uh, is really profitable. But um, but you've just got a big premises, and you've got to have a lot of staff on the tables. And so when you don't just have basically no one in the casinos, um, you're still burning cash. Uh, it was quite amazing. The entertainment stood down nine thousand people, basically all its staff. Uh, it was quite incredible and. Uh, I think we're very lucky as a, a team and individuals to do the jobs that we do and uh, be doing them because it must have been frightening for those people to get laid off and not knowing when they're going to be coming back and, and still uh, not really sure when they're coming back. But uh, there is, uh, just focusing on the margin issue for a second, first of all, it's going to take quite some time for these businesses to get back to what we would call normal earnings. Um, the one thing I would say, though, is when I've been through Melbourne Casino, which is which is huge, there does seem to be a lot of space in them. 
there's always a lot of empty pokies and a lot of empty bars and tables around. Like they really are big sprawling places. So I think they can actually deal with the social distancing better than, uh, you know, a restaurant, for example, which is, um, you know, extraordinarily difficult. So I think they're better placed than most. And clearly there's a demand for the services. We've seen online gambling, which um, Mickey's probably following closer than I am, just skyrocket at the moment. So people's behaviour hasn't changed, just where they're doing it has changed. And I think as soon as they open up and people have the freedom to go out, I think people will start going back. The one thing that's going to take the longest, and it's a, a link between the tourism sector, so the Sydney airports, the flight centres, you yep. name it, is the international travel. Um, yep. you know, that seems to be going to be the last thing to recover, and I think that's going to be quite slow. Um, so the question is, do Star and Crown have the balance sheets uh, to get through this period where they haven't got many customers, uh, or do they need to raise capital? And I, I actually thought Star would raise some capital, and I bought a tiny amount of shares myself. I was going to get this cap- access to this capital raising and put in 30000 bucks, and it just hasn't happened. And I think that's because of the way they've been able to access uh, JobKeeper and cut their costs. But mm. the way I was looking at this um, business, uh, it's not just, just on an earnings basis, but this is a business with a current market valuation of $2.8 billion, and the Brisbane Casino alone is going to cost $2 billion, the new one, which will be open in a couple of years. Now, obviously, it's going to be slow to ramp up, as any new casino will be, but um, you're really not paying a lot for the Sydney and Gold Coast casinos. And the way they've financed the growth in those businesses, because they've both been refurbished recently, is they've been selling apartments on the development, and they've been getting the money in as those developments have been going up. So really smart ways so that debt didn't explode as they were doing these big developments. So I think it's actually been really well run. And um, the main thing I'm thinking about longer term is just the competitive uh, intensity between uh, Star and the new Barangaroo Casino, which Crown owns. Uh, and it was interesting that and a really good thing that Star recently signed a contract with the New South Wales government that changed to pokey legislation so they don't have the monopoly on pokies in, in the casinos, uh, right. then they will get um, a rebate or, or some sort of financial, um, not reward, uh, compensation for that, which I think is really important. Even though I, I rec- a while ago that, uh, I don't know, the start of the business had a, an agreement like that with the government and then the New South Wales government reneged on it. So maybe it's not quite as sure as I think it is. Are you, are you concerned at all about the flow of Chinese um, tourists and gamblers specifically? Uh, it, the, the relationship between Australia and China looks like it's going really one way. And I worry sometimes what happens if, um, you know, a lot of the flow of Chinese um, gamblers comes from these junket operators, which are tightly regulated, and there's a lot of state intervention. And there's very, it's very easy for the the Chinese state just to switch that flow of gamblers completely off to Australia. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I worry sometimes what happens to Crown in particular, but also Star, uh, if that if that channel gets switched off. Is that is am I worrying too much? Is that not really a concern? Uh, I think it's an issue, and I think it's actually something that's been highlighted for a while, if for no other reason than other places around Asia, including Japan, are looking to open up new casinos. So yep. the space was big for the for the whales, if you look like, more competitive anyway. Hmm. That's one reason, like Star in particular, is I think 95% of the revenue just comes from that's right. um, domestic yep. or going to the nightclubs or whatnot. So I don't think it's going to impact them anywhere near as much the the casino in brisbane I, I, it's a bit like when you see uh, apartments for sale on the internet and they you see how nice the apartments look and then when you see them built they all look the same and they're actually not all that nice the casino in brisbane looks like it's going to look awesome it's in a great spot it's going to be far bigger and better than uh, the treasury casino isn't it um, mm. could really pull some more punters in and potentially more from asia because it's a bit closer better up there um so I feel like that's a very good, in, going to be a good investment, but we don't really know what the returns are going to be until uh, it's open. But it's done a deal with a couple of other Asian investors, and they're redeveloping the whole site. So it's going to really transform the city, uh, perhaps in the way that South Bank um, has been done in in Melbourne. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just a wonderful area. There's so many restaurants. It's just a place to go after the football, or if you're Nath, many Nath, people kill it, the you're... state. You're, you're killing Mickey. Mickey's locked down in Melbourne, you remember? You, you, you're <laughs> destroying him. 
<laughs> but how wonderful <laughs> Melbourne is. So nice to walk around after the football. Dear, oh dear, poor Mickey. Sorry, I cut you off. Continue. No, so I, I just think um, they're good assets. They're, they're certainly irreplaceable. They're, they're, um, I just think the long. I think it's, their recovery is going to be slower than probably what I expected initially. Uh, but the main thing is as long as the long-term value is intact. Uh, but the thing I'm probably more focused on than anything is just that competitive um, intensity between the, the same thing abroad to see what other casinos are attracting um, the big whales. Mm. Now, Mickey, w- without resorting to, to tears, uh, how do you feel about the, the casino stocks? Do you have any strong views on them? And you know, particularly Crown, which you may be more familiar with. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, Nathan and Graham have covered them pretty pretty well, so uh, I don't don't really know what more I can it? add to the to the discussion. But um, yeah, I mean, well, if the share market's anything to go by, you know, that's it's as um, you know, gambling isn't going away anytime soon. So are you personally uh, in, in buying these, is this are these stocks on your rate? I mean, they are for my particularly. I, I agree with the comment about Star Star in particular. The discount there looks quite attractive. The amount of traffic that comes from um, a domestic um, custom actually is an advantage in my view, and it's actually on my uh, personal radar watch list. That's a stock I'd be keen to add. I, is it the same for you, or, or you, you gambling is not really your thing? Well, I mean, no, it's it's not it's not like an ethical decision or anything like that. It's uh, to to be honest, it hasn't really been on my radar. Uh, I guess I haven't haven't got you know a huge weighting to property personally, uh, or you know um, this kind of sector. But it's it's uh, yeah, I can see at a price. You know, I I just think you know the growth is 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 kind of the thing where you know it's. Um, it's 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 going to be hard to grow at really high rates for these businesses, and um, you know I I prefer to be in businesses that are growing relatively quickly. But um, I guess there's definitely a price for it, and uh, you know I've just I think personally I've just moved away from buying things that are cheap um, and buying things that are trading at a discount. But I think. You know, there's definitely a price for this kind of business because it's a it's an extremely valuable business. Um, these casino stocks, so yeah, uh, I wouldn't. It, it it worries me sometimes that that quality sometimes, especially in a market like this kind of frenzied market, it gets defined by growth. And I think quality and growth are two quite different things, although they can be related. For me, Star is actually and and Crown, I'd add in that basket, are actually high quality businesses even though they're not growing very much and i'm always i mean we really want to buy high quality businesses at reasonable prices is should be on the to-do list of every investor and growth i look growth is great to have but i the growth the price that, that growth attracts in this market is a bit um frenzied and frightening for mine i'm almost i've almost i mean you can probably see from my um, recent recommendations i'm almost now going back and trying to find um, businesses that that are a bit more boring and aren't growing that much, um, and I think there's arguably better opportunity in that. Yeah, I I think that's a good point, and I, you know it's probably I've probably you know uh, absorbed some of that from the market as well. You know it's it's uh, you know these high growth stocks are the ones that are getting rewarded, uh, and so that could just be a personal bias as well that's, that's kind correct. of crept in. You're, you're, Sorry? You're, it's it's probably your age as well. Nathan and I are too old by <laughs> But I think you're right though. If you can if you can get, you know, a, a reliable, you know, eight to ten percent return in this environment, that's probably pretty good. And, you know, you probably you probably won't get the big gains uh that, you know, as a as a personal investor maybe you're looking for. But if you're just looking to, you know, grow your grow your wealth um, that you've already got, uh, then that's pretty attractive. And if you can do it at relatively low risk, like I think of something like, you know, United Overseas, uh, which has got, um, you know, no debt and, uh, you know, it's got those founders at the, at the helm and it's just kind of relentlessly generating cash. Yeah. Uh, and it's on nine times earnings. Well, you know, it's not gonna it's not gonna double in the next couple, you know, in next year. But you know, it's just kind of reliably 
providing you a return and you know an environment where you know re- reliable returns are hard to come by that's that's uh that's pretty good so yeah i think i think personally i've just probably become a bit biased and um towards that but i think you're right like you know these boring businesses are still very valuable so for me personally i i only really looking for things in this environment that can go up three times or more over time and star doesn't fit that but in our intelligent investor portfolios we've got to own between 20 and 30 stocks and this is a like star in particular is one you can just see like maybe in three or four years where the new brisbane casino really starts ramping up and they have a you know one really good year uh, with the whales and you know they lose a lot of money tourists are up you know the economy is recovering and everyone gets excited and you can see that um, you know the share price i mean this is a company that's had a six dollar plus share price in the past and that was before uh, you know any new two billion dollar uh, brisbane casino and you can just imagine there'll just be a, a period where everyone gets excited about the stock and they see the earnings going up a lot and could be a six dollar stock again and you're paying you know two dollars eighty today so even if it takes four years to get there or even five years um you know we're only if we can do ten percent with a business like this i think we'd be pretty happy but there's a chance there you actually do much better than that and do somewhere between 15 to 20 percent but it those returns might be very back-end dated and i think that's just the old lesson about long-term investing is that in markets like we've had for the last five six years everyone's looking for instant gratification and the hardest thing to do when the market's been zigging in one direction to one type of stock or one or two types of business for so long, the hardest thing to do is zag and do something else. And I think Star to me is, um, you know, you never know whether these things are going to work out when you buy them. But to me, it's a classic value play, long-term play where people just don't want to sit around and be bored for two or three years waiting for things to get back to normal. Um, but I just don't find that as an investor, I can wait until we start to see the momentum in the earnings come because potentially the stock's already up 30 to 50% before then. So you miss out on the big yep. gains. And it's just, I just found it really hard to, to wait. If I see something that's cheap, you never know when something might happen to realize that value. So yep. uh, I haven't really changed that as much as I've tried to consider the way other investors do it. Who would rather wait to see the momentum in the share price and the earnings coming. If I see something that's cheap, I just still buy it. Yeah, I'm exactly the same way. For me, the maximum return comes from maximum uncertainty. The more certain you are, the lower your return is likely to be. So if you're sitting there waiting for the numbers to improve or regulations to change or something to happen, then you're almost by default leading into your potential return. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's a personal thing um, and there are many ways to play this. Mickey, I- I've actually got to say, you've turned me around on UOS because I was <laughs> Dragon's Den. I didn't like it and I haven't really... Uh, only only took you a couple of years. But, uh... <laughs> I've done a little bit more reading on it and the share price has come down a bit. I think that's an idea we want to discuss at some point um so i'm gonna call you in for another podcast i think soon to to do uos the uos special the uos podcast yeah um yeah i mean well it's they've got a remarkable track record and uh it's you know it's um you know i think you know not many people are aware of it i i read about it first in a newsletter from Tony Hansen yeah. and uh and 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 so then I started to to research it and I think you know it's the low liquidity as well uh that you know you, you know it's it's one of those opportunities where um you know big funds can't get involved in it but I think for retail or for 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 smaller investors like us uh you know it, and it's a relatively reliable uh, income. I mean, there's the whole Malaysia thing, um, which scares off a lot of people too. I do. Uh, I have an eye. Every every time US goes gets mentioned, Mickey goes off on it. <laughs> <laughs> loves, loves it. <laughs> but let's let's save it for the US special, shall we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Relax. We're going to do it, Mickey. I promise. We are going to do it. <laughs> I reckon we should. Maybe probably, next week uh, we could. Maybe next week we could do a small cap special, and perhaps I don't know if you got any gore for There's a couple of stocks I own personally, which we can't cover in the newsletter because they're too small or too illiquid people right, might be love interesting it. love it we'll do a small cap special okay better frantically look this stuff done <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we've said it on air we've got to do it now um gents we better leave it there i think we've we've rambled on for for long enough but mickey great to to have you hope things um are okay seriously in, in melbourne we, we jest a little bit but we yeah we, we do have you doing okay 
it is it is a bit dire. Um, it's a bit unfortunate, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, we've got it relatively good here in Australia, so yeah, I think could be, it's, could be worse. Uh, yeah. I was, about, I was about to say to Mickey, just go to the beach scene. He lives the beach, but it's the middle of July. It's probably the last place you want to go down there. <laughs> well, no, we're not, I don't think we're allowed. No, I think we're, yeah. uh, we've uh, we've got to have a. We can only exercise within a certain oh, geez. radius. So, uh, yeah. But I think there's going to be lots of beach walks going on soon. There's going to be lots more walking. I noticed as soon as shutdown started, everyone just started walking. No one ever walked in their life before that. But then all of a sudden, when we're banned from walking, everyone just wants to walk all day. So, <laughs> well, I've, I've definitely noticed that I've never worn um, athleisure wear as much as I have it in my life. It's basically replaced my entire wardrobe. I wear it all the time. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, Nath, um Anything else to add or should we we'll rule it off there, right? Okay, uh, we'll off, right? Good job. Thank you, Gaurav. Thanks, right. Gaurav. Thanks for joining us, guys. And for everyone else, thank you for listening.